William Adolphe Bilgeru, 1825-1905 Each day I go to my studio full of joy. In the evening when I'm obligated to stop because of darkness I can scarcely wait for the morning to come. My work is not only a pleasure, it has become a necessity. No matter how many things I have in my life, if I cannot give myself to my painting, I am miserable. This presentation was created to honour the life and work of what can easily be argued as the greatest painter in the history of mankind. I began this work by pronouncing his name the way it should be. For far too long many a Philistine has pronounced his name Buggeroo, which I find triggers my senses of deep offence. I would like to make it clear here that from this day forth in the history of art his name shall be pronounced Buggeroo and any person offending this new law will be deplatformed on social media and hunted down by the Twitterati mob. My slideshow is dedicated to the man named William Adolphe Bougerou, who was born in La Roche, France, on the 30th of November 1825 into a family of wine and olive merchants. This artist, above all others, is the one who has most inspired me to become a painter in the realist style. His family, although well respected in the community, had to precariously eke out a living with their limited sales. The town they were born into was a very small and quiet place where there was only a small amount of business done. It is actually quite surprising that William would develop such an interest in art there, as there was a little in the way of cultural stimulation at the time. There were no galleries or cultural centres where he could be exposed to art. It seems his interest was in, a, in his nature, and it is no surprise he had such an aptitude for learning technical skills in painting when he finally entered the College of Art in Paris. It was when he went to live with his kind uncle Eugene, who was a priest, William was forced exposed to the classical literature and Latin. This introduction to a classical education was instilled deep in William and is something that he passionately developed for the rest of his career. His whole over is a synthesis of Greek and pagan mythology, Christian religious moral motifs and also the everyday common people whom he loved. It was under Eugene's tutelage that it was decided the young artist should go to Paris to enter an art academy and begin his formal training. With some 900 francs he saved from gaining commissions to paint his uncle's parishioners and also his mother's contributions, William could finally set his sights on Paris. Adolf, who at a very young age showed exceptional talent in drawing, gained entry to the French Academy of Fine Arts at 20 years old. And it was there in his college years he excelled in the craft of drawing and painting and went on to win many prestigious salon awards and merits in his course studies. He was born to be a painter. It is quite noteworthy that Adolf was born just at the same time the liberal progressives in society began to attack the, acad the academic traditions in art. At the very same time the French Academy began its decline at the hands of the modernist artists the universe gave birth to the greatest painter a man has ever witnessed. God, it seems, has a sense of humour, and it's as if Bougerou was sent as a final statement in the beautiful arts, as if to say, this is the excellence and beauty you were destroying, can you do better? And there was no better man sent to do this divine work, for Bougerou was noted for being a very upright and righteous figure, with a legendary work ethic and a reputation for having an indefatigable passion in his work. In his career, he was a well sought after leader. Many institutions and organizations offered him presidential roles. He gained several prestigious titles and positions in many art organizations, and in his later years was given the highest award by the state in service of the arts in France. No other artist in the European academies was ever awarded so many and so high an honour as Bougerou. He is the most highly decorated and respected artist in classical art history, and it is unbelievable that so few people know his name or even are remotely familiar with his oeuvre today. 
This is due to the unrelenting vendetta against his name at the hands of the leftist modernists and the mainstream art critics of his day. During his lifetime, but more so upon his death, art dealers and critics alike set about utterly destroying the reputation of all the Academy's main players in the traditional movement. Bougerou was their main target as he was the most famous, and for the next century his work would either be hidden from view or ridiculed in publications. It is only very recently with the work of Fred Ross that we see any fair and balanced appreciation for his work. Thankfully today, in a pluralist art world, we are witnessing a fair opportunity to set the record straight on Bougerou's work and present a fair appraisal of what he achieved in his life. It is true the work of Fred Ross and the ARC organisation in America. We are witnessing a revival and an upsurge of new interest in the academic style, most especially in Bougerou's work. Today we see in the West and also in China a new renaissance in art, where our contemporary painters are turning their hand to the classical realism once more. It gives us hope that the hundreds of years of technical know-how has not altogether been lost through the modernist onslaught of the 1900s. So with that very short introduction to this great man, let us now examine some of his works and touch upon some of the reasons why they are so significant in the history of art and even today. The Birth of Venus This painting of the popular topic of Venus is typical of Bougerou's output. Here we see a good example of his skills in rendering ultra-realistic figures of the female nude. Here we see examples of both Botticelli's and Cabanel's attempts to tackle this timeless motif. In Bougereau's version, we witness a clear and marked difference in both approach and technical skills. In this masterpiece, we can clearly see a mastery of so many aspects of painting. Our artist here demonstrates an unparalleled expertise in a number of formal disciplines in his art. In terms of draftsmanship, composition, depth and perspective, colour mixing, romanticism, realism and above all glazing, we see all this converge and culminate in the most mesmerisingly beautiful renderings of the human form and nature in history. We must stop here to understand that these images now are presented to you in digital format. This takes away from the true quality of experience of the art in question. To view this work in real life would be a very different experience. In its presence, you would experience the illusion in full, where you would feel compelled to be able to reach into the picture plane and embrace the figure. It has been noted that there has been people in the audience brought to tears upon seeing some of Bougerou's paintings. The gallery goer coming upon his work is often rendered in aesthetic arrest at the level of such beauty and skill. Bougerou, among his peers, was known as the painter of skin, and it was in his technique to layer muted tones of paint laid down upon a number of clear coats of varnish. This approach rendered a marked translucency that was unrivaled by any other artist of his day. This application of numerous layers of semi-transparent flesh tone left the viewer with a surface quality that seemed to breathe life. He was famous for painting hands especially, and his rendering of underlying veins was unbelievably lifelike. And with that short expose of one of my favourite paintings, we can now examine the next canvas, which is that of the Satyr and Nymphs. Satyr and Nymphs. Here we can see yet another masterpiece that demonstrates William's genius. This piece, in my opinion, is one of his top five greatest paintings. In it we can see his clear understanding of shadow and chiaroscuro. Again, we witness his patented technique of applying paint to multiple layers of clear varnish. In this instance, it gives the shadowy recesses an atmosphere and movement of air that defies belief. To see this in real life is to be faced with a canvas that has so much depth of feel it would make you dizzy. Bougerou was often denigrated by the mainstream art critics for being too sweet and attached to long past traditions. But in this image, we see paint taken to a new level never seen before in art. 
It was well within the artist's daily studio sessions to experiment on the go with paint, and he would often apply any number of techniques and approaches to solve formal problems. This is another good example of his love of the Greek mythologies and also the female form. He was often criticised for painting highly stylized portraits of women and young girls, but those cultured and informed aficionados noted that his portraits, although stylized, held a very good likeness of the sitter. He was an expert at painting a portrait and beautifying the sitter in the classical style. This is why he was so sought after by high society, who would often beg to have their wives painted. With the next series of paintings, we can look at one of William's favourite subjects and one which he is well noted for across the Western world. We can take this section as an opportunity to correct some lies propagated by the modernists in his day. The subject most loved by Boudreau was that of young girls. It was a theme that was present right throughout his career and it left us with some of the most beautiful and romantic renderings of youth in art history. Firstly, let us dispel the myth that Bourgeois and the Academy were staunchly against modernist impressionists at the time. The whole impetus behind their movement was founded on the complaint that the Academy did not entertain the impressionists and their approach to painting. This is a lie. It was in actual fact well known that any artist presenting their work in the annual Academy Salon could and did display some of their looser sketchwork. These studies were quintessentially impressionistic in appearance and were included for decades before any modernist ever complained of falsehood in public. The modernists claimed that they were the first artists to ever present impressionism to the public audience, but we can clearly see in Bourgeois pieces areas that are markedly impressionistic and loose. This was a device used in composition to render less important background areas in a more loose and unfinished manner, to streamline the viewer's eye and attention to the central figures. We can clearly see in this one example how the background is very impressionistic and loosely rendered. This technique was struck upon long before the modernists made any claim to genius with it. The modernists also claimed that they were the first artists in history to turn their attention to common people with a view to paint them with dignity and honour. Never before done by the Academy, they said, because the Academy was too interested in catering to the social elite class for financial gain. This is also a lie. Here we see just one example of many that destroys the modernist argument in a moment. Bourgeois was well known for painting lower class subjects with such an intimate gentility. He painted peasant girls imbued with such grace and nobility that no person could ever argue that he was an elitist. This was a well established part of the trad traditionalist school and it is a blatant lie to say they never turned their brushes to such common subjects. Bourgeois loved people and he dedicated his life to studying the div divinity held in each and every one of us. The modernists claimed that Bourgeois was a relic of the past who was doggedly fixed to ancient and long dead traditions. This is also a lie. Bourgeois, in his time as president and teacher at the École de Beaux Arts, was the first man ever to champion the cause of women artists. Up until William's leadership, it was unheard of for a woman to enroll in the college for an education in art. Moved by this injustice, he campaigned to have women allowed in the halls of academia. He won, and for the first time in history, women were afforded the right to an education in art. He was a true progressive in his day, and any accusation of him being too old and stale are unfounded and downright unfair. With the next and final image, I will prove that Bourgeois was a visionary, years ahead of his time, and will remain relevant for centuries to come. We will use it as a springboard into how Bourgeois has inspired my own art practice and see how his pieces influence me as a painter. The Indigent Family 
This painting struck me as one being years ahead of its time, and it is something I used in my own career to illustrate a point as part of my own oeuvre. My recent work was centred around the idea that there are certain prophecies at work in art history, and some of the classical oil paintings seem to be revealing messages that are relevant only in today's political climate. Although I do my own original pieces, I do often reproduce classical oil paintings and give them a contemporary twist. Here are some examples of some of the master paintings I have identified as having prophetic elements. This first piece, entitled A Roam Around the Hapenny Town, was painted because when I first saw Bougereau's version, I seen a connection between the main figures and that of the modern day Roma community who are known for aggressive begging in the city centre. His vision seemed so applicable today that I felt compelled to paint it. I painted the central figures and extended the canvas. I Dublinified the scene to tell the story of aggressive begging in the city centre. My version tells a number of different stories at once. I go off on tangents sometimes with symbolisms and I could stand for a long time next to my paintings talking of all the hidden meanings and the symbols used. For instance, in my version I could not help but paint a set of paintbrushes in the brush car bin. This story touches upon the fact that when I entered first year fine art college in Dunleary, I was instructed to go home and break my brushes and throw them in the bin because I would never make it as a painter. Today, all of my paintings are on display in the Darndale Bell Centre. My main body of work on display there was given as a gift to the Northside people. This painting, entitled H.S. Venus II, is also on display at the Bell Centre. In my reproductions, I often have fun making word plays and introducing jokes. This painting centres around the idea that the word venereal is derived from the name Venus. It is the disease of love. So in my piece, if you get close enough, you will find that Venus is having a herpes outbreak on her genitals. The irony we witness here when we learn that the oyster crops off the coast of England were dying off because they were infected with the herpes virus. It seems she has infected the very shell she stands upon. This piece, entitled Song of Angels by Bougereau, is one of my favourite pieces of art in history. My version was painted to celebrate Christ. In my version you will find litter strewn about the ground and even in a scarred cigarette in the corner. The junk food wrappers reveal the word lion and king and it is as if there is a fallacy at play. It seems the environment is celebrating who Christ is. Mary is holding a mobile phone and the angels are playing along to the jingle to get baby Jesus asleep. If you are wondering what mobile network Mary is on, she's on Virgin Mobile, naturally. Bougereau has proven to be the greatest inspiration in my career so far. Although I will never achieve his level of skill in painting, I will strive to improve upon my own skill set. I have learned so much about painting in my efforts to emulate his style. My most recent paintings are my most proudest work. I have been trying to perfect his layering technique and I aim to introduce more muted greys to my palette in future. Perhaps in 20 years, I will get somewhere in my art that I will be happy with one of my paintings. I have a lot of work to do to ever come in close to doing Bougereau's work justice. The last slide I will share is my most recent large canvas entitled The Gagosian Fart. It is a modern parody on Da Vinci's Last Supper and it is painted to celebrate the community in Darndale Community Centre. Da Vinci and Caravaggio has also appeared in my body of work, but throughout all of my paintings I have tried to employ Bougereau's technique. Here you can see the final piece hung in its proper place. The canvas is 16 foot wide 
and was painted specifically for that wall. Currently, I am named as the resident artist at the Bell Centre Gallery in Darndale. I often give guided tours of my talks whenever they have open days.